Welcome everyone. Thanks so much for joining us for this presentation. Today, we are going to talk about how AWS is making it easier for customers to innovate their video delivery models um, with purpose-built cloud-connected edge devices. Um, my name is Ashley Cutler. I am a senior product manager here at AWS, um, looking over AWS Elemental Media Live. Joining me later today is going to be Matthew Norton. He's the senior director of technology at PBS Digital. All right, let's dive in. So really quickly, we're going to talk about a few uh, different items. The, the, the first thing we're just going to talk about are some of the unique challenges around content distribution um, and how we're making that easier with AWS. We're going to talk a little bit about connecting the ground to the cloud seamlessly, in particular for media and entertainment workflows. The next thing we're going to do is we're going to dive into two customer use cases. Uh, the first is digital cinema and deluxe. So we're going to look into how they've built this next generation digital cinema platform built on AWS, but that is connected to all of these edge devices in theaters that helps them manage the distribution of uh, feature films um, to physical locations. Um, the next thing we're going to look into is PBS, and we're going to look at how they're using the AWS Elemental Link, which is an edge uh, encoder that connects directly to the cloud. And we're going to look at how they are able to simplify their local live streaming uh, use case, um, bringing PBS content uh, to folks um, just like you. All right, so let's uh, talk a little bit about what video means when we're talking about um, cloud workflows. So for video, it really is all about connecting ground to cloud, right? And we're gonna look at two specific use cases today. Um, when we're talking about a broadcast situation, um, we're really talking about how do we get that live linear broadcast source uh, reliably transported to the cloud um, and making sure that it's reliable, making sure that it's um, robust, um, to make sure that we're able to do that live content transformation and delivery um, through the cloud infrastructure. Um, and then on the other side, so that's going into the cloud, on the other side coming down, right? And so in the next use case, we're gonna talk about how do we take, you know, large video files, content. Um, in this case, we're gonna talk about feature films. How do we get that and take it from the cloud and deliver it securely to edge locations? Um, in this case, we're gonna be talking about uh, movie theaters um, in a secure, reliable way. Again, all of these infrastructures are, you know, these architectures um, really are managed in the cloud, but then there's all of these devices that um, integrate into the cloud to make sure that this content delivery uh, solution is um, even easier, simpler, um, and more secure. So let's dive in a little bit and talk about uh, Deluxe and AWS and just talk a little bit about their digital cinema distribution uh, workflow. So the first thing here is that there are some challenges, right, with cinema content distribution. Things are changing rapidly. Um, one of the biggest things is that, you know, how, do, how have we traditionally moved this content around? Um, you know, obviously we started with actually shipping physical film, right? We're not in that world anymore. We're, we're digital. But even then, for a long time, we actually shipped hard drives. Um, and that can work, but logistically, it's obviously very challenging. Um, another way to, to do this is over satellite, um, but satellite requires a lot of capital expense. Um, it's less flexible. Um, so if you want to change up your content quickly, um, you know, really adapt, you know, really quickly to, to changing uh, consumer trends, it, it's not as flexible, right? Um, and that really leads me to my second point, which is content is now global. So we have content being distributed all over the world. It needs to be synchronized. Um, piracy becomes a problem in this situation. So we need to do this in a really secure way. Um, and we want to make sure that everything gets released on the same date and the same uh, time uh, all across the globe. Um, and all of those factors are actually making it so that the content windows are getting smaller and smaller. So we need to do this faster. Um, we need more, as much creative time as we can um, before we're actually able to ship everything out. So where does this AWS snow cone come in? Um, so AWS snow cone is a small, portable, rugged, um, and secure edge computing device. Um, and there are really some, there's a lot of benefits to the AWS snow cone. We're not going to go into detail on every single one of them here today. We're going to focus on the ones that are applicable to this workflow. Um, so 
The first thing is that it's designed to be outside of a data center, right? So it doesn't need the same um, power cooling technology that you would have in a traditional environment. Um, it is definitely suitable for, you know, facilities that have variable security. Um, so, you know, we're able to do things like all the content is encrypted at rest um, and in transit using um, you know, key, the key management server that is actually, so the, the keys are never stored on a device. So it's highly, highly secure. Um, the, there's able to do a lot of local analysis, um, collect actions faster. Um, there's this uh, DevOps model, right? Where any changes to the device that need to happen there um, is actually tested in the cloud and then deployed at the edge. And then we're, this isn't in the slide here, but one of the great things is it's actually built with AWS Data Sync right built in, um, which means it's very easy to transfer content into and out of the cloud in a secure, automated way. So real quickly, I'm just going to touch on this IP-based distribution workflow. So Deluxe has built this orchestration layer on top of AWS. So it is managing all of this digital cinema assets coming into AWS stored on S3, again, with that encryption. It's managing the synchronization of these snow cones that are distributed globally out to all the theaters. So you have a theater, you've got a snow cone sitting there. And then all of the decisions about what content gets out um, to these locations is managed through um, the deluxe uh, uh, vision uh, system and is making those decisions. It's also making the decisions on when it needs to pull back. Um, so once the theater no longer has the rights to display that video content, it is then uh, written off of the device in a, in a media compliant way. All right, so now we're going to talk a little bit more about PBS and how they are using a different AWS uh, Edge device, AWS Elemental Link, um, to help get your local content on any device. So real quick, um, we're going to talk a little bit about what are, what are some of the challenges we're talking about here. Um, so first of all, audiences are shifting, right? Um, they view their content all over the place, online, on their phones, and local broadcasters are looking to get their content into their audience's hands just like everybody else is. And so um, how can they do this? How do they achieve this? And that's actually exacerbating another one of these shifts that we see, which is how do I innovate quickly without spending a lot of money up front, making a huge capital investment? Um, how can I change that to an operational expense or a really low capital expense um, in order to enable some of this innovation? And then we touched on this a little bit in the deluxe example, but IP is really becoming the primary distribution mechanism. Um, and that is allowing us to transform how we're getting content into viewers' hands. So where does AWS Elemental Link fit in? So AWS Elemental Link is a very small um, purpose-built, basically SDI port into the cloud. Um, it allows you to connect seamlessly directly into Media Live in a, uh, using HEVC. Um, and as, you know, we'll, we'll learn a little bit more about this, but ARQ protocols like Sixty and SRT to get that content reliably in the cloud, even if network conditions are variable or imperfect. Um, it's, it syncs directly into Media Live, which then can be used um, for distribution through an origin, through CloudFront, or any other um, mechanism after you know, it's in the cloud. So now we're going to bring in Matt Norton and talk a little bit more about this use case. Matt Norton is the Senior Director of Technology at PBS Digital, and we're going to be learning a little bit more about how he worked with AWS to solve this problem. Welcome, Matt. Thanks for joining us. Hey, thanks for having me, Ashley. So can we start off and just tell us a little bit about your role at PBS and what PBS Digital uh, does within, um, for all the member stations? Yeah, so uh, Matt Norton, I run engineering for PBS Digital, and um, you know, PBS is a public broadcaster, and uh, but it's really our stations are the broadcasters, and we're just the affiliate organization. But we provide a lot of support to our stations, uh, building out a lot of central technology. So, you know, uh, I'm responsible for pretty much all of the online uh, experiences for a lot of our where our viewers meet our stations. So we've built. Uh, mobile apps, OTT apps, and, uh, you know, uh, obviously our websites and all the platforms that power all that stuff. 
uh, primarily well, for PBS, for PBS Kids and, and PBS Education. Got it. So talk to me a little bit about this local live streaming project, right? It's, it's to get these local live broadcasts into all of these digital apps and websites. How, how did this project come about? Yeah, so, you know, we've had for the last decade or more, we've, we've had an online uh, VOD platform and um, viewers can sort of come in and then they're localized to their local station and they get a mix of some local VOD assets as well as a lot of national uh, assets. But there's, it's, it's missing that local component of the live stream. There's a lot of content that is local that's just not on there. Uh, you know, local news and a lot of you know, the events and just in general, a lot of the local feel of that station. So um, stations have wanted and viewers have wanted to have that, that live linear uh, broadcast uh, in these devices that they're, uh, you know, wanting to engage in. And, um, yeah, we just, yeah, that's, I guess that's the, that's sort of like where it came from. And yeah. Yeah. So what was stopping you? Um, what, what, what were some of the challenges that the stations had in, in getting their local broadcast, um, up into, uh, you know, these apps, um, and distributed through the applications and the web experiences? Yeah. So, um, you know, I think I've mentioned to you before that if you've met one station, you've met one station. And mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, a handful of stations had already built out their own live streaming infrastructure or, or worked with vendors to do so. And so in their, um, you know, some of them have built out their own apps and websites and all that kind of stuff. And so they were already doing this themselves, but we've got over 150 stations and they really do come in all sizes of, you know, and they're all excellent, but this is a hard and at times expensive problem, you know, to get right. And um, furthermore, not only is it hard for the stations to have to go out and find uh, a vendor and, and set up or, you know, set up their own solution or whatever, um, each station has their own internet connectivity, you know, levels of, you know, goodness or badness. And, uh, and we don't own any of the stations, so we don't, have really direct control over any of that kind of stuff. So, um, and then also, if they were to, even if they could produce a bunch of live streams, getting it to work in our centralized apps that we produce for all these OTT platforms and everything else, you know, we started trying to integrate a handful of those live streams that stations had, and it was sort of a nightmare just for the handful working through incompatibilities with our HLS clients and, uh, you know, getting cores headers right, getting just every every aspect of it was a challenge and that was just for like the first couple that we were doing there uh, so really we we were struggling because we didn't have consistency and we didn't have control or any operational like any way to operate that even if it was running right so to scale this out to 150 stations you really needed something that was going to be fairly consistent that you could control um, that was easy for the stations to set up um, could deal with some network uh, connectivity issues or uniqueness um, in the physical stations themselves. But then it was also important to be able to, you know, manage those devices, right, and, and, and understand what was happening there. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of ways we could have tackled this problem. But uh, right as we were really diving into it, you know, the link was announced, uh, the Elemental link, and uh, it seemed to fit the bill exactly for what we were you know looking for and you mentioned a lot of the aspects that it has but you know we've got um these are broadcast stations they have broadcast technology and so they've got you know 5997 frame rates and sdi and um they've got caption requirements and, and ancillary data that needs to flow through and um so it required a device that could act was actually sort of broadcast grade that could handle that type of technology um, but we also were concerned about doing encoding at the edge just because, you know, we didn't, it would be harder for us to control and I think maybe more static and less able for us to, to manage. Um, and also depending on the bandwidth, it takes a lot more bandwidth to push an entire ABR stack across, you know, uh, from the edge. And so we really looked at this centralized, uh, HLS ABR encoding. And so the thing we focused on was let's find a contribution encoder that could could get all these stations uh, signals 
securely you know, compressed as best as they as it could you know and uh, but also I think the biggest thing was sort of like you said we didn't want it to be complex for the stations uh, to set up and we didn't want it to be uh, hard to manage so um, yeah the link's been been great for that it's other than a handful of you know uh, firewall reconfigurations we had to do to to open up the Zixi protocol, um, which would have been, you know, needed for I think just about any encoder you throw into those stations. Um, yeah, it was mostly just drop in, plug in and play, and uh, so basically we just shipped them out to the stations and uh, went to town. Great. So I want to dive into this uh, workflow diagram a little bit more. So you just queued it up for us perfectly. You've got 150 station sites. The live feed is going into the AWS Elemental link on site, right? C can you walk us through this? Yeah. So, um, you know, stations have their signals going into the link. They just drop them into their data centers or into their broadcast uh, centers. And uh, it goes over commodity internet. Obviously, it could go over uh, a dedicated fiber line, but I think in most cases, uh, no one has really a direct connect right now uh, to Amazon. So, um at least I don't think any of them do. So just using, going straight over the internet, it does all the, like you said, compressed HEVC and uh, it uses the Zixi protocol. And then we do all the centralized processing in, and really, there's not much to configure, but you know, if there is anything we need to configure on the device, um, we do it centrally from the Media Live. Uh, and so Media, really, the, the link is just a contribution encoder, single bit rate, and uh, we do all of the ADR streaming encoding in the cloud in that media live and um, from there it writes the live files to a um, media store which is our hls origin and then that's fronted by cloudfront which is our content uh, distribution network and you know all of our uh, apps and everything else all of our station players all can use those streams from there so I want to dive in a little bit more to this failover input that you've configured here. I see this uh, PBS uh, national feed coming in. How, how does that work? Yeah, so, you know, Media Live is an incredibly robust cloud encoder, and it has all the ability to set up multiple inputs and all that kind of stuff. And uh, we looked at what was the most cost-effective way to, to get out the gate, and we thought, you know, let's ship a single encoder to uh, the stations. And if there's any kind of failure in power or internet or in the device itself, um, we'll have our national feed, which is basically you know our content that we ship out to stations for over the satellite and stuff. Um, that's you know it's not ideal to be on there, but that is at least a live stream, live content uh, that is um, able to be failed over to. And so it's just configured as a second input in each of those media live channels. Um, so and CloudWatch, works, yeah, I mean, as far as that goes, it it works. It's basically set up through a CloudWatch alarm. Great, and then all of that's being controlled through this uh, local live streaming console, right? It's it's setting out these um, some of these configurations, and and it's coming back into that to give you those alarms and notification. Yeah, so I mean, there's a lot that you can just do right within the Amazon console, if you've just got like one or two, you know, however many, you, know, you could do as many as you want, but we had a very quick turnaround. You know, we, we did this in, I think three months, uh, and you know, had everything out there and everything else. So, um, and it's a, it's a handful of us on borrowed time. So, um, we thought let's script as much of this as we can. And of course, Amazon's got, you know, really robust APIs and everything. So, um, and a lot of stuff was already in the console, like, you know, metrics are flowing into CloudWatch and um, all that kind of stuff. But uh, we built this little console, which is just basically a web admin that allows our ops and support folks to come in and configure new stations. And that spins up, you know, the Media Live uh, channels and uh, sort of links the link device to it. And um, it configures. You can control sort of the audio mix down. So if a station has five one and they want to get down to you know a stereo output or something like that, or if they want to split out their secondary audio program, that kind of thing. So we can set up those kind of configurations, set up uh, you know blackout slates, and um, and yeah, we we have a, a single pane of glass that we can tie to a whole bunch of PBS uh, data as well. So 
we can um, marry it up to our local station APIs and uh, our pager duties and Slack, and um, it shoots emails out to uh, station contacts and stuff. So if, if there is an auto failover, because um, you know this is wired up to like a CloudWatch alarm that just receives that that webhook through SQS, and um, yeah, basically from there we can respond. What do we want to do with it? We want to we want to auto fail over to the national. We want to email the stations and uh, do anything else we want to do there. Yeah. So I'm noticing this uh, synthetic alarms. Talk to us a little bit more about why you set that up and and how that helps. Yeah. So um, I mentioned that we had a couple of stations that um, you know had come to us with their HLS streams and uh, initially they're still in the system with those streams and uh, we don't have any insights into how that sausage is made. Uh, all we really have is that HLS uh, URL from them. Um, but there's there's those stations, there's also um, just our own stations. If there's any kind of glitches with um, CloudFront or, or Media Store, anywhere after Media Live where we've got those metrics of like, hey, is the device okay? Are we getting the signal? We've got all the CloudWatch metrics, but there's just the synthetic is sort of checking from outside to make sure that those HLS streams are are active, live, being updated regularly, and have sort of valid HLS content in them. Got it. I think there's some other benefits too, right, of being able to manage the transcoding all in media live because you can do so remotely. Can you talk through a, a SCSI blackout uh, workflow um, and and I think you have a really good, powerful example there of how having everything managed in the cloud was allowed you to able to do some kind of unique use cases. Yeah, so you know most of our stations have worked hard to clear all their content, but there's a handful that you know need to uh, block you know some of their shows that they haven't cleared yet. And so um, already we've opened up, we've basically put a proxy on the media live uh, through this little LS console. So it's a small API. Um, that the stations can schedule and you know do their own um, blocking of content basically using those you know SCUDI uh, I think it's the SCUDI type 16 or whatever it is you know that, that sets up the web delivery restrictions you know and basically you can configure your media live to respect those or ignore them or whatever and uh, so if a station sends them in locally through their SDI cable. They can insert SCUDI there and do it, or they can call our API. And we've configured the media lives to respect those and to uh, put up the slate that's been configured uh, when it does so and then take it down when it's supposed to. Um, but yeah, you're right. There was a really cool thing that uh, we stood up really quickly. Um, you know, we were given an opportunity with a few days turnaround time to um, take this sort of premium bit of content from a producer, but we didn't get the streaming rights to it. We, we got the broadcast rights uh, for our stations, but we didn't get the streaming rights. And so um, we were trying to figure out like, well, how are we gonna do this? A lot of these stations don't yet have any way to like, the same cable that's going out to the broadcast tower is being plugged into the link basically, you know? And so how are they gonna block it on their channels? And most of them had not integrated with our API or anything. We thought, all right, let's just do a quick, let's look at our TV schedules API, which is basically, you know, Grace Note, and figure out when this show is going to be on on each station. And then we just programmatically walked through and said, all right, let's block it from here to here on this station, from here to here on this station. And that was just, you know, all scripted out and just basically called the Media Live API and injected those, or that scheduled those triggers. And, uh, so the stations really were able to show that content and, you know, within a couple of days we had this, you know, all configured and ready to go and it, it really was flawless. Yeah, so PBS Digital did everything on behalf of the stations. The stations didn't have to worry about configuring any blackout, which, which could have had some real negative implications if for some reason that blackout content ended up going out to, to the live streams, right? Yeah, I mean, I think, <laughs> yeah. We would probably have seen a lot of stations have to make the choice of, can we broadcast this or not? Right. So, real quickly, we you've also have this view for the stations to be able to go in and to see, you know, the the notification and make sure that everything's working and configure their own alerts and and everything like that. 
Um, what has been the response from the stations? How, how have they found working with this? Yeah, so, um, you know, it's early days there. I mean, we're just opening it up to them, but uh, well, we've just, as of this exact moment, uh, when we're recording, have opened it up to them. But uh, they're, they're loving the fact that we've sort of taken the operational uh, you know, we've got auto failover, but we are, don't want to have it flapping back and forth if there are like network issues or whatever. So we auto failover, but we um, we let someone needs to make the decision like, yeah, we're stable again. Let's turn it back on. And so it has been a handful of our ops folks who are just getting those pager duty alerts. But now we've really pushed that into the station's hands. They're getting alerted and they can just hop in here and do that fail back. And uh, I think they're really grateful that uh, they don't have to wait for us, frankly, to, uh, you know, respond to, to things. Um, so, yeah, and in general, you know, um, how are they responding to just this system? I think we, our viewers have, have been really happy. The, the stations, you know, have, have really, they've been asking for getting their streams into the uh, apps for a long time and uh, to be allowed to or to with help with it in some cases. And uh, so... Yeah, like you have up on the stream, you know, we've we've just seen that this has been really helpful, particularly, you know, at the time that it has been rolling out is right during this national pandemic, which uh, is really, there's been a real need for the type of content that PBS has been able to provide, this educational content that can um, help with distance learning and really, you know, help our viewers to, uh, yeah. There's, and it's it's also really important to the viewers, right? Um, yeah. We've gotten some good feedback directly from uh, audience members. Yeah, we've gotten a lot of very positive feedback. And I I was surprised at that. I don't, you know, um, I guess I've been just doing the VOD stuff for so long. I, I wasn't sure how successful this was going to be. But yes, we've seen a ton of folks who are just really ecstatic to see that local station and to, to be able to just have that stream, you know, just sort of curated local content and um and yeah, you know, like the one you have up, um, it was something that this this viewer really felt incredible. Uh, yeah, it, it resulted in in very goodwill and uh, donation and, and everything else, and you know, another uh, member of another station. So it's amazing. Well, thanks so much, Matt, for talking us through that and walking us through your architecture. Um, that's really fantastic. Thanks so much. Um, and I want to thank you all uh, for joining us. Um, we've put together a few resources for you. If you want to learn more about Link, you want to learn more about AWS Snow Cone, um, or just learn more about these use cases or the techniques here, some resources that we've provided uh, to make this easier for you. Again, I want to thank Matt Norton for joining us um, and talking us talking through this architecture. And yeah, thank you so much and enjoy the rest of reInvent.